We are ready. Thank you for that introduction. You actually revealed uh, like one of my secrets here. Uh, my name is uh, Rocky. You can call me Rocky, uh, but it means actually stones. So it's a pretty gray and boring name. And uh, that, that was what they gave to me, you know. Uh, but fortunately, my wife's name is Birgit and uh, she's here. Uh, it means uh, precious. So together we are precious stones. And uh, as you can hear, she adds uh, value to my life. Uh, she's not here, unfortunately. So you're stuck with, uh, with a gray and more uh, gray and ugly part. But uh, that's it. Uh, you can see her on the picture here. So uh, just uh, to show you that I'm not alone in the world, we very early on got the son. His name is Eric, and then another son whose name is Trigva, and, uh, and then we got uh, a daughter whose name is Sigri. It's very traditional Norwegian names. And uh, after having three kids in uh, just four years, we said, God, you've blessed us more than enough. This is fine. And uh, we want to have time to be in ministry too, so uh, let's stop here. And... Uh, then we did some Norwegian family planning, and four years later, by the grace of God, uh, we got another son, you know. It was actually his will, and not ours. But, uh, and then we said, uh, fantastic, uh, no, this is abundant, so we, don't, we, don't, uh, we, have, we have what we need now. And uh, uh, now we want to work for you. And uh, God had other plans, so four years later, again, another son. And uh, so this is the complete uh, Opheim family. By, by the way, my family name means open home, and uh, we try to live according to that, you know, and uh, open our home, not just for more kids, but for visitors as well. As you can see, there, there, there wasn't any more place on the slide here, so that's why we decided to stop after, <laughs> after five. I don't know how you make that with six. Uh, is it, how, how do you do that? But uh, we're, So we come from Norway, uh, life up north is... Uh, um, you may have heard that Norway is a very good place to, to live. At the same time, uh, we have our challenges. And so I head an organization, it's called Tent, and uh, you see the logo down here, if you can see it here. It's, it's uh, su supposed to symbolize a tent uh, and a fire, and the word tent in Norwegian means uh, being on fire. So we have this resource center for tent making, uh, professionals, business people, and students bringing the gospel to the world. So we. Uh, train them and, uh, and uh, follow them up. The, our work has three main areas. Uh, one is recruitment for people who want to go overseas. The other part is training. And the last part is member care. So, uh, and then we have this course that we do around the world. And we started Tent in 2000. And uh, we started working internationally outside Norway in 2005. And now we run uh, annual courses in many, many places around the world. So that's great. And uh, if you're concerned about numbers, I'm not, but <laughs> many people ask about numbers. We've had participants from more than 50 nations at these courses, and they have gone to uh, more than 80 nations to live as ambassadors for God's kingdom. So that's, in short, uh, what we're doing. And I just want to warn you here, since everything is being recorded, you should try to behave well as we do this session. Is that OK? because they don't want, they don't want any, anything to mess up with. So don't scream, OK? It's like, keep calm. So being God's ambassadors in the workplace, and uh, Scott, I warn you, I will report back to your church if you fall asleep, OK? He's jet lagged. But uh, I can see you. I can see you, so I fall. <laughs> OK, uh, so here, here is the outline of the session. Uh, we will look at the work of another world. And this is working with a with a higher purpose, like bringing a higher purpose into our workplaces. And we will start with looking at why God created work, because so many people, they don't know that, and they think that it was actually a penalty, work is a penalty. And with any penalty, the more you can avoid it, the better it is. So, uh, and we see many people, even Christians, uh, approaching the workplace with that perspective. If I can avoid it, it would have been better. My free time, that's where I live. So work with a higher purpose. And, and then we will look at, so that, did, that is work in itself and how that can be a ministry to God in itself, what we do in the society. And then we will look at how we can be God's ambassadors or God's children in the workplace. And we will look at an example of that. And then at the end, then we will not focus too much on that, but we will look at working in another world, meaning uh, going cross-culturally 
with your profession. And uh, at the very end, some important reminders we will, we will look at that and how God has given us great uh, promises regarding all this. So uh, I've chosen a model to work from. It comes from this book here. And I know God, Scott had some uh, very good teaching on, on crossing cultures. And he knows this book too, I think. So it's Leading with Cultural Intelligence uh, by David Livermore. And I don't know, it's not written from a Christian perspective. Maybe you know if he is a believer or not. He is, yeah? He absolutely is. Yeah, because I feel that when I read it. But uh, the book is not written from that perspective. But he says, and uh, this explains something I've been struggling with for a very, very long time. He has his cultural intelligence. And he says that, and we've seen that many times, that when you, we have people... Uh, moving to another culture, and they live there for 15, 20 years, but they don't change, they don't adapt to the local culture. And I wondered many times, because you see other people moving and they adapt immediately. So what is the difference? Because very often they have the same knowledge, you put the same knowledge into people. Some people adapt, some people don't. And, uh, and Livermore, he points out that you need something before the knowledge, that's the drive. It's the drive to change. And if you don't have the drive to change uh, culturally, then uh, it doesn't matter how much knowledge you put into people. They will not change. So this clarified many things for me when I read this book, you know. And, and looking at this drive is very, very important. And we will apply the same thing to working in the work, to, to bringing the faith to the workplace. Uh, because we see in the churches in Europe and, uh, you know, uh, North America, many of you. But in Europe, I think that's, it's, it's, a, it's a huge challenge that we can train people here. We can tell them how to represent God in the workplace. But nothing happens. Nothing happens. Nothing changes. Because we haven't, we haven't worked here with the drive. There is no drive to do it. And that's why we have to start here and we have to ask, what, how can we cr create this drive in people. What causes that, that drive to be there? And then, if you have the drive and you get the knowledge, you will form a strategy and you will act. But if you do not have the drive, uh, this formula doesn't work. The, the, it just stops everything. And I think that one of the main challenges we face in Europe today is that the drive is not there. People have no intention of bringing the faith to the workplace. Yes? Yeah, is, is this uh, motivation? Uh, it will, we will come to it, but it's the motivation kind of to, to take your faith with you to the workplace. Like to, to do something with it there. First love. First love, yeah? Yeah. We, we will get to it. You can ask again later. So we start with that. We start with number one, uh, the drive. And the symptom, if the drive is not there, is that you have no desire to live for Christ and share him with others, including in the workplace. And uh, when we speak about the workplace here, and I know that many of you, you are church leaders. Um, and workplace, very often when you, you, you asked to talk about workplace ministry, we tend to think that that is something that is another program. But this is, this is uh, all about empowering the people in your church to bring their faith with them in their daily lives. And... Uh, we were advised, here the subject is workplace, but we were advised not to use that word. I mean, bringing it to the workplace, it has its very specific challenges. But if you speak about that in the churches, you will lose half of your congregation because some people are unemployed, some are retired people, uh, some are working from home. There is kind of, they don't identify, they, they don't identify themselves as being people going to a workplace. So you can replace that word with frontline. Frontline. Everyone has a frontline where the kingdom of God that lives in us meets those who do not believe in him. No matter where you live, no matter how your life is, you have that frontline. And this is very much about frontline ministry too. Like you bring your faith to the frontline. But here we will use uh, workplace. So the symptom, if something is wrong, is that you have no desire to live for Christ and share him with others. And the cause of this is, as far as I can see, spiritual. 
it's a spiritual course. You've lost that. Someone mentioned her first love. You, you've lost that desire to share God with others. When I experience good things, I want to share. I want to share it with others. That, that's the natural thing to do, isn't it? Okay, yeah, I have a good experience. I, ha I have a good bank. You should become a customer in that bank. It's a Norwegian bank. <laughs> Even if you live in Budapest, you can, you can be a customer there. It's a very good bank. If, if you have that love and you have received that love of Christ, you want to share him with others. If you do not want it, there is something wrong in your relationship uh, with him. And you need to uh, deal with it there. It's like that's your starting point. You can always tell people to be more active. But if they have no desire to share Christ, you have to start with reconnecting them to the source, like to, the, to Jesus, to the creator. So the medicine here is strengthen relationship to Jesus and uh, that they can experience that God will live us life in abundance. And they can experience that actually, you know, taking part in society, using the skills that God has given to me, that's a part of his will for my life. I, I can live fully and wholly in connection with him as I work with my skills, use my skills in the society. For many people, that's a revelation because they think that they have to uh, work for a Christian organization or a church to serve God fully. I've asked uh, more than a thousand people, probably close to 2,000 people now. I've asked them, how many of you are in full-time ministry for Jesus? It's always those who work for Christian organizations and churches, they raise their hand. But the others don't. And then I ask them, what is your ministry? And they say, well, I conduct a choir, I lead a Bible study group, and things like that. It's always church-related. So we have this impression that if I want to serve God, it has to happen in that church setting. So it's a revelation for people. If you can tell them that God has created the fullness of life, including work, and you can bring your faith to the workplace, and you can serve God uh, through your work. So an average human being spends uh, approximately 80,000 hours working. I teach for young people, you know, I said, this is your future. You have 80,000 hours of work ahead of you. Do you like that? And, and most people say, no. <laughs> and then I say, well, I'm halfway through. There's only 40,000 hours left, and then I retire. This is fantastic, you know. Then I can live fully and wholly, you know, getting to 67, like we do in Norway. Actually, that was not the intention, but most of the time we're awake, we spend at work. Traveling to work, working, driving back home. That's most of the time we're awake. And it's very sad that the majority of the people in churches, they've not heard teaching on why God created work. And when you don't hear teaching about something, you think that God is not interested in it. So here is a display of nine out of ten people. They've not heard any teaching on why God created work. And they're really sad, as you can see. Because their conclusion is that God is not interested in my profession. I'm not called to do my profession. My work has no spiritual significance. It's very sad, isn't it? 80,000 hours, it has no spiritual significance. That's sad. And it makes a huge difference if you share God's view on work with people. And here, just to display the difference, here is the one person who has got teaching on this. Look at the difference. <laughs> Isn't that amazing? It just proves how effective the teaching is, doesn't it? <laughs> because he removes the knots here. He says, God, God is interested in my profession. I am called to do my profession. My work has spiritual significance. That's a totally different story, isn't it? When you write that story about your life or you tell about your life. Yes, I'm working and I'm working full time for Christ in my IT company, in my shop. I work full time for Christ. As teacher, I work full time for Christ. That's amazing. In Northern Europe, we focus a lot of, on our vacations and we want to combine life. Uh, let's do this first here. Uh, this is just a, I think this is because uh, theology has been formed by men 
you end up with uh, structures like this. Because men think in boxes. You women, you know that, that men think in boxes. It's like his, uh, one person, he compared men to a chest of drawers. So you open one drawer at a time and you play with what's in there and then you close it and you open the next one. Whereas a, a woman is like a wardrobe with one room. Everything is connected. And in theology, I've, I've been teaching this as well far back, like 25 years ago, <laughs> how the Bible tells us about how we should deal with ourselves, with others, with society, with nature and with God. And uh, unfortunately, we, we've made God into a box and that's the church. And we think full-time ministry, yeah, that's here, that's here. It's not here in these other boxes. But this is not a true picture. And if you, if you operate like this, we may end up like this, running from one arena to another. And uh, we want really to have that fullness of life that the Bible is speaking about. But that's not in the workplaces. This uh, illustration shows more, I think, the reality that God is everywhere. And he's surrounded, he's with us no matter what we do. And he didn't create beautiful nature uh, like we have beautiful nature here in Whistler, uh, he didn't create that as, as a background for our spiritual life. And God, he could have created us as spirits if the spiritual life was the only thing he was interested in. But he didn't do that. He created us as human beings. And he created us to be a part of a society, to take part in it. And he's there in everything. And we need to relearn that because it has been under-communicated. The Bible says that it is in Him we live and move and have our being. It's in Him we live and move and have our being. He's everywhere. He's not closer to us here, even if this is a Christian conference, you know. He's not closer to us here than He is when we drink coffee with our friends and have a good talk with them or play football or soccer or whatever you call it. He's just as close to us everywhere, and he's interested in the fullness of our lives. Isn't that good news? It is in him we live and work and have our being. And uh, I'm sure you've seen this in many ways before, the division we have created between sacred and secular, and it affects the work and the way we think about work too. The called and the not called, the spiritual and the, and the physical. And then we think that uh, if you want to serve God fully, we should be up here. And as John Stott pointed out, even up here we have a hierarchy. And uh, we think that if you really want to reach the top, and I've been there, I've been a missionary to Azerbaijan, you know. And I remember telling my friends, it's like, we have decided to go as missionaries. Wow, Steiner, you've reached that peak of how far you can get as a Christian. You, you're taking it all out. This is fantastic. Let's celebrate. So John Stott says, if, you're, if you really have strong faith, <laughs> You become, a, you become a missionary. If your faith is a little bit weaker, you become a pastor. It's not uh, <laughs> good to know, isn't it? And then it goes downwards, and, uh, and you become a church worker. And then uh, uh, even further down, you, I mean, then you cross the line here to, to the secular, and you get to the Christian charity worker. That's, uh, that's kind of crossing the line, isn't it? And... Uh, <laughs> And then it, it goes even further down here, you know. It's, uh, this is now you're in the red sector, you know. And, uh, and uh, you could be a humanitarian worker, but you can, you can get below that as well. You can work in the public sector. And, uh, and then uh, where, do, where, where do the business people fit in? <laughs> they, they actually are, they are here. You know, they're outside everything. They are at the very bottom. There, there, it's absolutely no spiritual life in business. It's, it's, it's like yeah, that's... Uh, and politicians, that was brought up by people in India. Politicians should also be there, <laughs> down there. So this is how we think, isn't it? Or uh, uh, unconsciously, I think, very often. We, we, this is kind of how we reflect, and we should try to avoid that. Let me give you a, a little task here. Uh, before we go on, and I only give you one and a half minutes because uh, Todd here, he spent so much time introducing me, so we have limited time to do the presentation. <laughs> what do you think of, or what do you associate with the word paradise? So speak to the person sitting next to you, and don't think just theologically. Think broadly, in a broad sense here. What do you think of when you hear the word paradise? Do that for one and a half minutes.
Okay, okay. That's good. <laughs> That's one and a half minutes. <laughs> Not much time. So what keywords did you mention here? Anything, like quick ones. Come on. Leisure. No worries. Wow. Beaches. Beaches. Uh, beaches. I have a, I have a picture of paradise here. Yeah. 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 <laughs> nice beaches. Harmony. Harmony. Yes. Good. Grandchildren. Grandchildren. Wow. Yeah. Relaxing. Relaxing. Yeah. Relaxing. So here's another beach. You know, this is actually. This is Bali, it's relaxing. So, uh, as you heard, no one mentioned work. No one mentioned uh, Monday morning, 8 o'clock, that's paradise, you know, driving to work, stuck in traffic, this is paradise. Why, why didn't you mention work as a part of paradise? Yes? Because there are people. <laughs> <laughs> they are people, you're not included. Yeah. <laughs> paradise, they're not people. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. We have lots of space in Norway. You can move up there. You, you, you will not meet anyone for years, you know. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. It's the opposite of work. But, uh, you know, in the Bible, we can read about the, the only paradise that has existed. And we can also read about the paradise that is to come. And we have these ideas about paradise. And uh, if, they, if, they're not, if, if they're not correct, when you look at how pa what paradise was like, we have, to, we have to change our ideas, right? So let's look at the paradise that has existed. And uh, I've written here that in paradise, God is or was working. Is that right? Was he working in paradise? This is before the fall. God was working. He was creating. Was that work, or did he just walk around speaking like wasan? There was wasan, stars, flower, just speaking, and that's not much work, is it? <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> you're a teacher, is okay, but he was creating. Well, there is something in that uh, Genesis one indicating that this was actually hard work for God or costly work. What is indicating that? In Genesis, he rested. Yeah, the Bible uses the word rest. After he had done everything, who's resting? Well, someone who's done some hard work. There is another indication too, and we can't, we can't go deep here, but uh, what is God doing at the end of nearly every day? Yeah, he looks at what he has done and he says, this is good. Yeah, this is good. Have you experienced the, the same thing? That you look at what you've done in a day and you say, this is good? You do that when you've done some, some hard work. And uh, you can see the result. Do you have any engineers here? No. That's too bad. Because uh, I have an idea. It's a business idea, you know. Because I work so much on this computer, at the end of the day, I close the lid, and I look at it, and I say, wow, that was good. A good day's work. But it looks the same as in the morning, so it doesn't work. So if you have IT people, you know. Tell them that make a computer that grows a little bit <laughs> if you work really hard or change its color or something. It would have been amazing, wouldn't it? But I, did, I renovated uh, our home. Uh, we have an old house from the 1950s. And then I got this feeling, like I think God had in Genesis 1, because I was creating. First you tear things down, but then, you know, I made a new floor. And I looked at it at the end of the day, and my family was living somewhere else. But I looked at it and I said, this is good, this is good. And then I did something that God did not do at the end of every day. I called my wife. I said, Birgit, you have to come and see what I've done today. And she came and we looked at it and we, and we said, wow, this is good. This will be a nice place to live. Next, next day, you know, I, I, I put up a new door. Same thing, I looked at it, wow, this is good. Birgit, <laughs> you have to come. <laughs> And look at it, and we both looked at it, and we said, this is good. So we're created in God's image. We do many of the same things that he did. And he looked at it, and it was valuable, costly work for him. God was working. In the New Testament, we can see that Jesus did God's work, what his father wanted him to do. But let's go back again to uh, Genesis 1 and 2, because it also explains our situation. 
And God created us as human beings. He created us as workers. Do you agree? This is before the fall. And he, we, we, we were created as God's co-workers. And that's amazing because I think that the calling that uh, the first people on earth got, uh, that calling remains the same for us today. And we will re read just two Bible verses together. And, uh, and uh, let's go to Genesis 2, 8 and 15. Genesis 2, you can open your Bibles that you brought with you or on your cell phones. So Genesis 2, because it explains our situation. Genesis 2, 8. Again, we hear God is working and he says, uh, Now the Lord God had planted a garden in the east in Eden, and there he put the man he had formed. So planting a garden, is that work? Yes. I can't keep my plants alive, so it's obviously some work lacking. <laughs> planting a garden is work, and then uh, God forms man. But let's read this in combination with verse 15. Because there God says, or God does, he says, or oh, it's written, the Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to work it and take care of it. To work it and take care of it. This is before the fall. God created us as co-workers. He wanted us to work and take care of the garden he had created. And that calling remains the same today. And if we look at our surroundings, and if we look at the church surroundings and the surroundings, work surroundings of the people in our churches, that's their garden. And God's calling is the same. You work and take care of the garden that I've created you in. Use your skills. Be a part of it. In order to work a garden, you have to be inside the garden. And uh, we have to be there. Like John Stott again said, we have this calling to be the salt of the earth. So many Christians today, they withdraw from society and they sit on the outside and criticize the society for going bad. It, it rottens. But he says that was the effect, like the salt was supposed to keep the food healthy. But if we withdraw from society, it will rotten because we, we are the salt of the earth. So in order to take care or preserve the food, we have to become a part of that society to be integrated in it. Okay, here's what we have seen is that work was a part of the only paradise that has existed. Do we need some more air in here or is it okay? Are you okay? Is what you're fine? Okay, good. And then it's also part of the paradise that is to come. Revelation 22, 3, it says, his servants will serve him. That's you and I. We will serve God in eternity. Not everyone likes to hear that because they think that, well, I'm working so hard here on earth and uh, fortunately, here on earth is only 80,000 hours, but eternity, <laughs> how many hours would that be? It's indefinite, you know. And uh, I said, well, you know, heaven is like an eternal work day where the sun never sets. And the question is, would you like to go there? Ask the question. Well, you know, something happened to work in the fall the work environment became more difficult. When we feel stress, overwork, and all these things today, that was not the part of God's intention. It was not his intention. But when we get to heaven, we can again fully and wholly serve him with what he has given to us. That's good news, isn't it? Let me share a little story about the opposite, because this is eternity. And uh, it would be rather boring, I think, if we were just doing nothing up there. <laughs> Uh, I, I met a Chinese woman on a, on a ferry from Bergen, my city, to Stavanger. It's further south in, uh, in Norway. And uh, she was from a Chinese background. Um, we started talking. And uh, very early on, I, I said a sentence just to make her understand that I was a Christian. And then we talked about everything and anything for nearly two hours. And she was leaving this ferry halfway. So ten minutes before she was leaving, she says... Uh, I understand you're a Christian. And I say, yes, I am. And she says, well, you know, the way you uh, teach about heaven makes it a place that I don't want to go to. And I say, why? And she says, you know, this is my life in Norway. I'm married to a wealthy Norwegian guy. So he, he works at the university. 
Every morning he goes off to university. He doesn't want me to work because we have more than enough money. So I just stay at home. I watch TV, do nothing. When he gets home, we go to a nice restaurant to have some good food. He doesn't want me to cook. After the meal, we go back home, we watch TV, and then we go to bed. And next day, same thing. He provides everything for me all the time. And that's how you Christians say it will be in heaven. God will provide every, everything for us all the time. And I said, well, you, you know, I think that's wrong. And I showed her this Bible verse, and I said, it says here, his servants will serve him. It means that you will be allowed to use those skills that God has given to you in heaven. You will be able to serve him. And I also added, and if you're not there, you will be missed. I don't know if that is true, though. But, <laughs> but uh, that's what I said to her. And then she left the ferry. And uh, I'm not so good with names and faces. So I don't know if I met her again. And I don't know if it made an impression on her. But uh, at least I was able to share something. It's good news, isn't it? We will be allowed to serve God in eternity. Work is a, a part of that paradise that is to come. So work is a gift from God. It was God's initial intention. It's a calling repeated in the New Testament that we should work. And uh, in all this, it's a calling to live for Him and not for, ourself. this, for ourselves. This is not self-fulfillment. I want to build my career with everything that God has given to me or with my skills. This is working as unto God in everything we do. So we point at him when we do a good job. So that's a huge difference, isn't it? We point towards him. We want to show who he is. Okay, here's a task for you. I give you four minutes for this one. <laughs> wow. You have a desire. Uh, this, is, this is more complicated. You have a desire to empower people who want to live as God's ambassadors in their workplaces. What will be your main ingredients in the program? Four minutes from now, talk to the person sitting next to you. Good input. Uh, knowledge. Now we get, we've looked at that uh, drive part and uh, uh, speak that vision into people that they work, even, they work, even if they don't say anything about Christ, they represent him in the workplace and their work is a ministry to God. And uh, for many people that will give them uh, that higher purpose in what they do in everyday life. And even that, you know, that's opening new doors. And now we get to the knowledge part. The aim here is to prepare the followers of Jesus to live as his representatives where they are including the workplaces. And the focus is, we can go back to the theology of work. Biblical knowledge is always good to have. Although, where we come from in uh, Norway, we, have, we, we train that we, to think that we always know too little to do anything for God. So I've heard people, you know, they've been Christians for 30 years, and then they want to share a testimony, and they stand up and they say, if there is a pastor there, they say, well, you correct me if I say something wrong. It's like, after 30 years, you don't have to say that. It's, come on, you know a lot, and just share. And if you know, I tell people, if you, if you know only one Bible verse, for instance, John 3, 16, God will use that in the situation. It's, that's the Bible verse he will use. If that's the only Bible verse you can find, he, 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 you can use that. So don't, don't be afraid. He will use you with the knowledge you have today. Uh, we should have knowledge about society and culture and uh, understand our role as ambassadors. And uh, this is from uh, an organization called Stand to Reason. Uh, uh, the role of the ambassador. You need knowledge. Knowledge about the work you're doing. Knowledge about the king that you represent or the president or whatever nation you live in. About the king's character because you are to display the character of your nation. The thoughts of the nation or the leaders in the nation, the purpose, why you are there, where you are. And then you need wisdom. And this is how we can train people. You need diplomatic skills. And as Scott, I'm sure you shared yesterday, I was still not here, but uh, communication. Huh? To communicate things in a culturally relevant way, it's so important. And then you need those diplomatic skills. If you start sharing Christ with a Muslim and you start out with trying to convince them that Jesus was the Son of God, 
it will not work out, uh, most likely, <laughs> right? <laughs> you start in another place. You start by loving them, for instance, and sharing life. So diplomatic skills and uh, knowledge on how to deliver the message in a wise and relevant way. And then the character, the ambassador's way of behaving can either contradict or underline his or her message. And uh, we are actually this letter from Christ. We are his ambassadors 24-7. All ambassadors work 24-7. You can't criticize the nation you work in in your free time and get away with it. You can't say, well, I criticized the president of Azerbaijan yesterday, but that was in my free time. Now I'm the amb ambassador. And I, didn't, I, don't, I, I do not mean that as the ambassador. I mean it personally. You can't say that. 24-7, that's your mode of operation as an ambassador. And we can either underline or contradict our message with what we do. Speaking about that, uh, we're following a, a lady. Uh, she works at the university in China. And she's not a smiling person. Uh, she, she never tells a joke, so people don't laugh around her. Uh, never any joke, no, laugh, no laughter. But still, she has this higher purpose in her work. And she has this attitude, I work as unto God with everything I do. And people can see that that gives her a lot of joy. So she says so many times in her workplace, people come to her and they ask her, how do you find such joy? in your work. And then she explains that, you know, I'm not only serving the leaders of this university or this nation, I serve the Almighty God. And she can share her faith in Christ because of the way she conducts her work. Okay, what is the number one reason for people to come to Christ as adults in, I think it applies all over the world. It's based on a survey done in the US. So the Americans, you would know this. It's relationships. <laughs> That's the number one reason. Relationships between those who know Christ and those who do not know him. And this is how, may, how we often operate as believers, you know. The believers say that's the red dot, you know. And this is the rest of the society. And we sit in the corner and we have such good time together. And we can, when we relate, we can even pray together and, and have a deep spiritual fellowship. But we have a uh, few connection point to the rest of the society. This is what happens when we move out to the workplaces and into the society. Can you see all the contact points? As long as we sit here in the, in the corner, a few points. This is kind of Sunday morning. And also how we behave very often in our, our spare time. When we move out in the society, we have uh, access to many people. And that leads us also to the world's largest unreached people groups. And you know that uh, People groups, they have very difficult names, always. So here is one, two biggest ones. One is Agues, and the other one is Burs. That's the ending. So the, it starts here with Coleagues. Coleagues. Coleagues is number one. Many people say colleagues. And the next one is Neighbors. Or many people say neighbors the biggest unreached people groups in the world, your colleagues and your neighbors. It doesn't mean that we shouldn't go to the unreached people groups that we can read about, the Joshua Project, absolutely not. We need, uh, there is a greater need for Christian colleagues and Christian neighbors there than anywhere else in the world. If you live in Pakistan, you don't have any Christian colleague in most workplaces. Someone has to move there to be that Christian colleague and that Christian neighbor. But here is what Gypsy Smith said many years ago, he said, there are five Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, and the Christian. Some people will never read the first four. So he died in 1947. That's why he said some people. Uh, today we would say most people will not read the first four. But they see your life as a Christian. And they make a judgment of the kingdom you represent based on what they see in you. You are that Gospel. And the question is, are we good Gospels? Are we trained to be good Gospels? So that's the knowledge. And then after having knowledge, we can move to strategy. The aim here is to plan how to bring God's presence to the workplace. Some basic components in this strategy is this understanding that God is present where we are. God's kingdom is near. His Holy Spirit lives in you. You bring prayer into the workplace. You can pray for people, even without asking them. 
you can pray for people by name. Isn't that uh, fantastic? And then you can also be proactive in praying for people when there, when there are needs. And even in uh, secular nations today, people open up for that because they feel that the need is there. And then this principle is not in John 10.10. 10. This is, uh, where is it? Whatever you do, work heartily as for the Lord. Colossians 3, 23, that's right. Whatever you do, work uh, heartily as for the Lord and not for men. Because it's the Lord we are serving. Prepare to share God's word. Always be, uh, be ready to uh, share the faith that lives in you. And we should have knowledge on how to lead people uh, to Christ. A great tool that we've found that is used many places in the world is Alpha, the Alpha course. You know the Alpha course? And there is a special version of the Alpha course. It's called Alpha in the Workplace. It fits very well in societies where you have a one hour lunch break because one session takes 57 minutes. So it's, it's like it's, it fits to that format, one hour lunch break format. They do it in many, even in restaurants in Singapore, they, they run Alpha in the Workplace. People come there, and the restaurant owners, they don't mind what people do as long as business is good. So uh, Alpha in the Workplace, it's a tool you can take with you. And it's getting easier and easier to use because so much of the teaching is on video. So you just watch the video. We are doing, uh, in our home now, Alpha for Youth with some young people, 14-year-old boys, you know. And they really enjoy that. It's fantastic to see how they open up for that message. You know, we, we try to start with Nicky Gumbel and his teaching, but that was too boring for them, even if he is a very good <laughs> speaker. But that Alpha for Youth, you know, wow, fantastic. So that's a part of the strategy. Okay, here again, a little task for you. We have to move uh, fast because we only have 18 minutes left, but I give you three and a half minutes to do this task. If you're a church or mission leader, how can your church be of help to those who live as kingdom ambassadors in their workplaces? How can you, in your current situation today, be at work for those who live as kingdom ambassadors in their workplaces? If you're already there as a workplace ambassadors, uh, ambassador, as some of you are, what assistance, what support would you like to get from your church? Speak to the person sitting next to you about that for three minutes. Good. Yeah, I can, I can share a little, uh, little uh, story. I, we just added a new work in Tant and she comes from a business background and she's worked for Christian organizations. And this does not apply to everyone. But what she said, like, that in business, she found excellence without faith. In uh, Christian organizations, she found faith without, without excellence. And that, I, I said, I, 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 <laughs> I don't like to hear uh, what you're saying, but I agree with the conclu conclusion in many ways. So, and I think if, if someone should strive for excellence in their work, it should be the Christians, because we work as unto the Lord. So uh, I think, you, yeah, to, to really strengthen each other in, the, in that. Okay, here's one story from India. This is Brother Sakti, and uh, we can pray that this can happen. Same thing can happen in Europe. Uh, first time I met him, I was uh, speaking at a fellowship for IT professionals in uh, Chennai. And uh, I just landed in Chennai. They brought me to this place, and I didn't wa know what to expect. And uh, there was a cluster of IT uh, companies there in that region or area of the city. And uh, then uh, for lunch or in the lunch break, once a week, they brought people together for more like a Christian meeting. Worship, prayer, uh, a sermon, prayed for, for, for each other, and then they went back to the workplaces. So in the lunch break. And he was there and he says, I started this fellowship, and when I was there, we, we had like 50 people in that fellowship coming together, you know. And he says, I started this fellowship, but then I handed over leadership to some others here, and I quit my job. And I applied for a job in another part of the city of Chennai, so I could start a fellowship there as well. So thinking as a church planter within the workplace setting, isn't that amazing? And uh, he's a part of uh, this uh, organization called the uh, Chennai Corporate Fellowship. And they started back in 2006. And uh, now they have 1,300 groups in Chen Chennai alone, mostly among the IT professionals. Isn't that fantastic? They have branches in Chennai, uh, some other places there, Bangalore, Hyderabad. 
they have international branches in Singapore, uh, the Emirates, UK, and the US, and their focus is to provide opportunities to every corporate believer to use their gifts and talents to inspire other corporate people. Isn't that amazing? And uh, what if something like that could happen in Europe too, that someone takes that challenge and starts to operate as a church planter in that work environment? In order to be effective witnesses, we need to know our environment. And many of us, I think we are too reluctant in sharing our faith. We think that it will have negative consequences if we do that. And I just want to show you one example. This is from a, a folder called Religion at Work. It's guidelines from the Norwegian Equal Opportunities and Discrimination Commissioner. That's not the church committee. It's a, it's a, it's a public committee. And uh, they released this paper uh, some years ago. And this is what they say about sharing faith. They say that to share openly that you belong to a religion or faith should be allowed. This is in the workplace. It is even desirable. It is important that everyone at the workplace respect each other's religion and faith. Praying at work, given that the environment is prepared for it, should not be seen as a mission activity. Isn't that fantastic? This is in secular Norway, formed by secular people. People are opening up for spiritual uh, things in the workplace, spiritual activity. And then after uh, uh, having the drive, the knowledge, the strategy, then you act. And when you act, your aim is to bring God's kingdom to the workplace and to see his will be done on earth as it is in heaven and implement that strategy, the plans that you've had or made. And I think there is a basic need as we do this, and that is, that is fellowship with other believers for preparation so we can, for instance, help each other to speak in a culturally relevant way, for prayer so we pray for each other, and for accountability so we have somewhere a structure to report back to. It's very, very important because many of us, we will feel that we fail and we may easily stop doing, stop sharing our faith in the workplace because we feel that we fail all the time. But if you have that accountability group where you report back and they pray for you and help you to be prepared, uh, it can work out in the long run. So that, that, is, that is good news. Okay, a little bit on uh, tent making here. We call this way of working that we've seen now, we call it the ministry of the open doors because when there is a relationship, you can share your faith. Uh, I have nothing against door-to-door -door evangelism. It's good. People have been saved through door-to-door -door evangelism. But it could be called the ministry of the closed doors. Do you agree? It's like, no, I'm not interested. Please, you can go to my neighbor. <laughs> I say that to the Jehovah's Witnesses coming to our door. Actually, it's try to invite the person, but he didn't want to come. Okay, the ministry of the open doors, because we have a relationship. The same applies to nations for tent makers. If you bring your profession, you can enter the nations. We tell people in tent, we tell people, if you want to go to a Muslim nation, this is a Muslim nation. If you want to go to a Muslim nation, even if it is Saudi Arabia, when you apply for a job, Give information in that application that you are a believer. And the good news is that if you provide that information, you're more likely to get the job than if you leave that information out. Isn't that amazing? These are doors that God has opened for us today. We can take the gospel to all nations in the world, including North Korea, including Saudi Arabia, including Turkmenistan. And the good news is that if you include information about your faith, you're more likely to get the job. Isn't that amazing? I can explain to you why, but we don't have time. <laughs> but one reason is that people, they've, some people have gone ahead of us. They've done a great job. They've been Christians. They worked with excellence. And of course, as an employer, and many of us, we have employed people. We're looking for those good people who can contribute well in uh, or companies or businesses or organizations. So tent making, we say, is taking this, <coughs> what we've seen here, take it cross-culturally. The foundation is always laid here. And this is a challenge for us. We call it marketplace ministry when we operate in our own culture. Foundation is laid here. 
In Tant, we, we, we try to move people cross-culturally. But it's very hard, you know, if, if this training has not taken place in their own society, it's very hard for people to be effective out here. Because you continue, very often, you continue to do uh, what you've done before when you cross the border. You just continue what you've done before. So it's important to lay that foundation. It's important for your own society. It's also important when it comes to bringing the gospel to the whole world. And here is the situation in the church today. In the red areas, that's where the gospel is least known. And they need Christian colleagues. They need, in those areas, they need uh, Christian neighbors. And in many of these areas, there are very few witnesses of Christ. This, this is a ratio of missionaries to native population. And even if there are so many missionaries in India, you know, the population is so huge that that's, uh, probably there is a small circle here, but it's not visible on this map. Whereas, I don't know which island this is, but uh, <laughs> few people, many missionaries, you know. <laughs> Let's just end by looking at uh, the Cape Town commitment. And uh, it was written... Uh, six years ago. It says, we urge church leaders to understand the strategic impact of ministry in the workplace and to mobilize, equip, and send out their church members as missionaries into the workplace, both in their own local communities and in countries that are close to traditional forms of gospel witness. We urge mission leaders to integrate tent makers fully in the global missional strategy. The, uh, the opportunities are great Today, this is a missions method that does not require great resources. We do teaching on this in African nations. For the first time, they say, for the first time, we can take part in the worldwide mission enterprise. Because the only need here is committed people. That's, there's a lot of committed people in African churches. We live in a globalized world. It's a globalized wo a job market. It's easy to find jobs today and start businesses in other nations than ever before. And new jobs are posted on the internet every hour. There is also a huge diaspora population that we can mobilize. Many Christians from our nations, they've gone to uh, nations where the gospel is not known. But they see that only as a work assignment. You can give them that perspective that you're there for a purpose. You, you're there because God sent you there. And you can reach out with uh, the gospel. Let's look at one slide at the end here, and that is this one. Uh, I don't know if you like being on the winning team. I like that very much. Unfortunately, our football team in, uh, in uh, my city is not very good. So we lose all the time. And in England, my favorite team is Liverpool, and also we lose a lot. So it was good in the 80s, you know, when I grew up. But I like being on the winning team. And here is the task or the description given, given in Acts 1.8. You will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. And we know that uh, we will succeed because Revelation tells us that we will succeed. After this I looked, and there before me was a great multitude that no one could count from every nation, tribe, people, and language will be there in front of God's throne in eternity. So where are we in this picture? Where are we? You know, we are here, in between. The task was given, it's not yet fulfilled. We operate here, and it's our privilege to be allowed to take part in it, and God's mission, and be on our winning team. And uh, we should really encourage people to join that team, <laughs> because it's a great joy to be uh, on it. Okay, that's... Uh, what we had time for.